alternatives to the museum paradigm. And the word class, master class, freaked me out a little bit because what I usually do is very simple, not a usual thing, but if, if I'm asked to speak, I always do it in dialogue with somebody, which is the key because then you don't have any homework. And what you do is you sit there, you know, then Barbara Walters asks you a question and then you just, so it's very easy, okay? But what I felt was I would try, so bear with me if I go slightly wooden, is I thought I, thought I should prepare something and then I can junk it if it's not, if, it, if it's flopping. But I thought I would try something which I've never done, which is to try to say, what the hell was I doing at this time? Like in this exhibition, I did like a hundred something exhibitions so far. So it's like exhibition A. Well, I always had a subtext because I approached it from a theatrical metaphor. And I went to, I, I went to act, I was an actor, a professional actor. And the main thing that stuck with me was when you're going onto the stage, where are you coming from? Where are you going and why? And then you go do that. So you have an action to play. So because I don't believe you start, your, you change subjects, but you don't go back to the beginning. You drag with you, you, you are the, I'm an actor who now has a, a store. So I'm, that's my skill set or set skills or whatever you call. So I would play an action. I gave myself an action. And, I, and so I wrote down a couple things as a preamble, and then it'll be a little bit more natural seeming. But uh, couldn't, oh, let's see. Okay, well, this is, this is just some of my thoughts. First of all, Moss was an alternative to the general paradigm of, of museum um, from the get-go, from 1994. But I masqueraded as a museum. It looked like a museum, but obviously, it wasn't a museum, it was a store. And um, it was an alternative, or perceived as an alternative, because number one, I sold things. I, the, the, museum, the things that looked like they were in the museum cases, you could buy. And um, the barriers which I set up, which was all the please do not touch, as many as I could print out every day. <laughs> please do not touch, please do not touch. Please do not touch. And the high platforms, which meant you couldn't possibly sit on that sofa because you couldn't, how'd you get up there? And the glass cases that were all locked and everything, that was a ploy. That was theatrical. Because what I thought would be, I mean, I've never said this before, but what my point was that you could instantly, when somebody came over, be Alice behind the looking glass and there would be a metamorphosis where suddenly the museum became a store because you'd wheel out the steps and you could walk onto the museum platform that was white and shiny and sit and mess around and see if you felt comfortable on the sofa. We would open a glass case at the drop of a hat. You could take this object, which you couldn't in a museum. So it was, I was going for the shock value, which was this is a museum except suddenly I get to do what I always wanted to do in a museum which without the alarm going off. <laughs> that was my, my motivation. And, I, and it sort of worked, sort of I say, because a lot of the time I knew it didn't work when people would say to me as they were leaving, do you know where we could buy any of these things? <laughs> 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 See, so, okay. Um, in a museum, everything, every functional object is rendered functionless because you can't make coffee in the coffee maker, you can't turn off and on the light, you can't sit on the sofa, and everything is priceless. It's a museum piece, it's priceless. It's priceless because there's no price that's given to it. So I repositioned museum back in 94 uh, yeah, I don't know if you're going to like this, as a shopping experience. I decided that a muse I made a correlation between shopping and going to a museum. That was, m I'm spilling the beans, okay? <laughs> and I really thought, why, and it started because I thought, why shouldn't you 
be, why shouldn't a museum exhibition be available for sale at the end of the run? Like, if you think about it, why not? Because people are shopping. And would it change your experience if you, could, if you, felt, if you felt it was available for sale? If you were shopping? That was, that was the thing. Um, the other sort of alternatives to a museum were that it was a very subjective narrative that I presented. Not according, objects weren't presented according to their function, but although it was an industrial design store at first, but they were presented for other reasons. There were juxtapositions which I made, which were made in order to illuminate or articulate certain connections between things other than the function. Like shiny, like I would decide, you didn't need me to, sh I didn't have to have a section called chairs. Because I thought, why? Like you're not gonna think, is that a chair? You're gonna know it's a chair, so what do you need me for? I'm just the middleman in the way that you have, the troll you have to pay under the bridge in order to get the thing. So what's my contribution? Because I was 45 and I was feeling, I wanted to, you know, feel adult and like sort of classy. <laughs> And merchants were not, you know, I never thought I'd be a merchant, okay? So I thought, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, I'm going to dignify the, I'm going to dignify you. I'm going to say, you could figure it out, okay? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, today, and it was very laborious, put all the shiny things together. So you can't miss, so you'll go, shiny. <laughs> That's cool. And then you'd buy the shiny thing that you need. Or, or not, okay? Because how do I know what you need? Or I would put heavy, all the heavy things, or all the things that have a small speck of black in it. Or, and I, and I, would, I would write this down, believe it or not, and then I would go through it and, it and I would do this, okay? That means that if on Thursday I took, and I would have things for years, years, that I, that I either bought and made a mistake, took years to sell, or that I would rebuy over and over and over and over and over, that people would come in, some of you would come in and go, oh look, that's new. And that's because you saw it yesterday or last Thursday as shiny, but today I'm showing it to you as red, okay? And, or I'm showing it to you as tall, or I'm showing it to you, because there are many facets, many directions to, to like a person. These are all people that graduated from Harvard. These are all people that live in Philadelphia. These are all people, you know, it's like, what's my line? I mean, you can, you can shape that. So I was very manipulative because my merchandise was always fresh, even though it could be years old, because I kept changing in a sort of Machiavellian way what I directed you to look at. I wanted to show the dual nature of certain objects their functional side and also the narrative or the evocative side, which I would refer to as the bonus that the designer brought to the objects whilst fulfilling the functional brief. If you've ever been to the Milan Furniture Fair, kids line up, you know, hoping to show, to get, to sell their design, okay? And they would go to Alessi and Alessi was primarily making plastics and have facilities to do bent metal. So they would show up with things, the bent metal or plastics, but then they couldn't help themselves. So they would throw in there a little private narrative, an agenda. Because otherwise, what, why do we have so many chairs? Why do we have so many coffee pots? It's basically, the whole subject is based on a, on a very lovely idea that I tend to over-romanticize, but, but I enjoy, which is that Designers create a kind of utopia. Once a coffee maker is made and is a given and exists in the world, the idea is now that that's our new coffee maker, I have an idea for a more perfect world to alter that and in a small way make it a more perfect world through a new coffee maker. It's like once an idea is presented, you immediately want to do something with it to make it more perfect, more better. And that's why there's so many chairs. 
chairs to me are thrones. And they all do the same thing. We don't need, you know how many chairs there are. But what a chair is, I think, to most designers, is a throne. It elevates you, raises you above your peers, gives you a, takes you off the, out of the dirt, and gives you a sense of, of authority, of dignity. So it's very appealing on a very basic level. That basic level, I felt, was lost in stores. When chairs are sold because they're, uh, they're grouped according to price, they're grouped according to manufacture, this is the alias section, this is the casino section, the okay? But if this is the thrones, you know, and how do you see yourself? Do you want the tallest one? Do you want the goldest one? Do you want the most humble one? Do you want the one that's best made? Do you want the one that's, that's made by a man or made by a woman? Or there are all these, I, I just was offering people suggestions of alternatives to, these, to the way that you would make a selection of something. Um, this uh, is not a new idea. I, I was interested from the beginning in presenting functional objects as a canvas. That's, that's what I did at, at Moss and what I continue to do. But that, would, that, was, my, that was my job, was to, to, to present functional objects without diminishing the function as a canvas for subjective ideas. Now I could do this because I wasn't selling medical equipment. I wasn't selling life-saving heart. I mean, a heart valve, come on, does it work? End of story. But a fruit bowl, you know, how well does it have to work? And maybe, maybe you buy six bananas and this accommodates four bananas, okay? So you don't buy it. But maybe you give up the two bananas because it does something else. So I, I wasn't, I focused on those, those objects, those functional objects, which in my opinion, we don't need. So I was dealing with, I was dealing with, a, it was a medicine show. I was, I, was sell, I, was, I was more interested in trying to sell you this, uh, this private agenda, this bonus, than I was the function of the object the straightest line between problem and solution. Industrial design is burdened with solutions, you know? And I, I didn't care, me, Murray, personally didn't care about solutions because I wasn't dealing with those kinds of problems. I mean, 50 watts, 75 watts, I wasn't that interested, okay? But I was, so, so that's what happened. But I want to mention that going back just a little bit, to 1988, uh, this guy Stefano Cacciani, in, in one of the, this book that's very important to me, and then I'll get off of this, wrote um, this book called Industrial Art, Objects, Play, and Thought in Danese Production. Danese is a company founded in 56, I think it was, in Italy, in Piazza San Fidelli. I used to go way before, you know, I opened a store or had an interest in the subject. And, he wrote this book about Denese in 88, so it was already 25 years ago. And I just, bear with me for a second, he wrote, Italian design, and this is what we're talking about, now it's very cool and current. But he, what he was talking about was Italian design is involved in the painstaking rediscovery of its cultural roots and the artistic movements. Not only of the institutional sort, such as Bauhaus, but also of the, what he calls irregular sort, such as futurism, surrealism, pop, and kinetic art. Awareness that there can never be a permanent separation between art and industry is growing. Although the functional design culture could not see any solution to the contradiction between art and industry, the Denese experience discovered a perfect blend for these two elements. And if I had a manifesto, which I don't, this would be it, to the creation of a series of products whose expressive and functional elements attain the same level of importance in a sort of essential equilibrium. That was, that's, that's what I did. That's what was interesting to me. So that's the kind of presentation that I did. Um, okay, some examples. This was uh, 
the first shop in 1994. And it was sandwiched between, I'm just gonna tell you why I did what I did, and then I could skip some of this if, if you want me to. But I wanted to have, so I'm set up with my canvas idea. And I'm thinking, the canvas idea is not gonna fly in 59th Street in the design district where all the competition is, telling, is overbearing the telling you what to look for, the function, the price, this is how much things should cost, it's a garbage can, get over yourself, Murray. So, so I thought, I'm gonna go to the art district. So I'm gonna go to Soho, and I had a friend, Barbara Toll, and she was willing to, it wasn't on the market, and she sublet me, ha, huh, $6,000 a month, this, this 146 Green Street. And I go to the landlord, and I go, I'm d sh opening up an industrial design store. They say, you're not, because we don't have retail in Soho if you can believe it. <laughs> they didn't allow retail, so, so I said, with my straightest face, oh, I'm not doing retail, I'm doing a gallery. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be like a museum. And I did that because I had no choice. <laughs> to get the space, I had, so that's why it looked the way it did. And so I, 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 this wasn't, I, I never had an idea of how it was supposed to look. I didn't care how it was supposed to look when I had my manifesto about this. But what I, but it, it was happenstance. They, they would only run to a gallery. So I thought, so I'll go and make a gallery. Who cares what it looks like? So I made this, this sort of um, uh, gallery and, um, uh, and then I expand, and then it, I took it into museum and then I took it into, from design museum into um, Museum of Natural History, and then I played with that whole subject. But that's why it looked the way that it did. And the reason I went to the museum district, the art district, was I had Pace on one side and Metro Pictures on the other, two of the most prominent galleries. And what my idea was, was look, every month, a lot of people are gonna come to each of those galleries, and I'm in the middle. And I'm not gonna say, I'm gonna call it a store, and I'm gonna put my garbage cans my beautiful garbage cans from Genese in the window. But these people are gonna be prepped for art, okay? They're gonna get in the taxi, they're gonna drive, and their mindset is, I'm going to look at art. So suddenly they're gonna walk by the waste baskets. I didn't do anything, I didn't lie, but they're looking at the waste basket as a color, a shape, a material, my agenda, okay? And I never said to them, this sculpture can also be used as a waste bin, <laughs> okay? I said, garbage can, $55. And it started to register because you begin a shop miles away. You, you, you begin with people's expectations. Let's go to Soho and look at art. So I'm either gonna fight that and go, oh no, 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 it's not art, it's, it's a housewares, or I'm gonna just, keep my mouth shut, and let your expectations play, you, you know, use your expectations. In other words, you go to the theater and you hear this is the funniest comedy in decades. The curtain goes up and you laugh. You don't know why, nothing happened, it's not funny, but you laugh because it's the funniest comedy in decades. So that was my deal. Okay, years later, but I wish I had done this from the beginning, um, I, I have this sign, Moss, and I have this sign, what do you believe, your eyes or my words? It happens to be by Philippe Pereno. It's a large photo that was made by an automaton. That's not the point. The point is, I put on an easel something that's called art. I mean, because it's flat, you hang it on a wall, but it ain't on a wall. And, it's, and, there's, and there's words, and there's no question mark to that question. So it's not really a question, it's me, posing a question, but not asking you to answer it, I'm telling you. And what I'm telling you is, Moss, what do you believe, your eyes or my words? And I'm answering it for you. You believe my words when you walk in that door. And what I'm trying to say is, subjectivity molds our experience of the real. And so I'm asking people and advising people and warning people this is a highly subjective experience. 
this, this business that I'm in. There is no truth to this. There's no absolute truth. There are multiple truths, to put it kindly. And so get ready, because your eyes don't know what Murray's up to. That my words are going to tell you something. Like, like, let's presume you don't know. OK? Put yourself in that position. And I'm going to take you someplace else. And what I did was show the back, because I decided a painting, an art piece, which is two-dimensional, is actually three-dimensional. It's a thing. There's a front. But did you ever think that there's a back? There's a side? There's, it's a thing. So I thought, that's why I have a right to use it as an industrial design store, because that's a thing also, like a book. Um, OK. The first thing I did was have a Tupperware party. <laughs> this goes way back to 94. I don't know, you know if anybody. <laughs> OK. What happened was I met this guy. What I did was, here's, here's the alternative to museum deal. Certain objects have an important, intangible, non-material aspect. In this case of Tupperware, how it is sold is part of the design of the object. So you go to a museum, and in this shelf, it says a piece of Tupperware. There. Who? So what? And then you read the sign, or you have a funky film that shows it. But I thought, I don't have to do that. What I can do is a performance. I can actually have you, you're never going to understand Tupperware unless you go to a Tupperware party, because that's critical to what Tupperware is. So I called up Morrison Cousins, who's died since, but he, we became friends. He was head of Tupperware. And I said, you guys are prejudiced you know, against Manhattan. You don't do Tupperware parties in Manhattan. You wrote us off. So I want to have a Tupperware party in Manhattan at Moss, my new little store. And I want to do it my way and your way. So here's what happened. So I got like a 7,000 page legal contract, because they thought I was going to destroy the entire company. <laughs> and what I did do was I got them to make black Tupperware, because it's Manhattan. <laughs> OK, and it was 1994, <laughs> which was already unreal. OK, and I did my, my arty display in the window of Tupperware, a huge tower of black Tupperware, and a piece of red Tupperware, and I did my little you know, color field thing, OK? Then the ladies, the Tupperware ladies from all over the country, this was the deal, the, the killers, the ones that would like outsell the ladies at Bergdorf, they showed up on the bus. And I had about 15. And we served margaritas. I said, it's New York. I'm not serving coffee. I'm serving margaritas, OK? And I invited like the people from Vogue. We had all these. It was a real New York thing. The average sale was about $1,500, as opposed to seven. Okay. So it was written about, because they were buying all this Tupperware. The Tupperware ladies were beside themselves. I mean, I've never seen such a, like, it was like hysteria. And I couldn't get on an airplane and look at a magazine without seeing the Tupperware party of all Tupperware parties, because, because it was, it, it's, it, it's necessary to, that was what I had to do in order to show you what Tupperware is. Not everything is puttable on a shelfable thing. Sometimes you have to look for what's the thing really about. That's an alternative to a museum. Um, also, I felt I wanted to start with a product that predated most people's awareness of what industrial design was. Because I didn't want to have a shop, industrial design is, associated with what's cool, what's new. New, 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 new. And I wanted to say, what's new? We go too fast. We throw it away. We, 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 we just want to look at what's new. Let's go back. Let's look at Stelton. Boring. Let's look at Arne Jakobsen. Let's look at an alto vase. You don't even know it yet. Let's just go back. So from the beginning, I wrote down six things that my mother had that I would vow to Murray secretly, I would always have in the shop, and my obligation would be to make it relevant. 
because I didn't want to just be about what's new, because I don't, that's not my first, who cares that it's new? Who cares, okay? I had to do it in order to stay in business, and people never let up with thinking, well, it's, what, what do you got that's new? But what I had was new, was a new way, was, was Tupperware, for example, because you didn't see it before. So that was what I tried to do. Um, another thing was, how do you show jewelry? Okay, I think in presenting jewelry, the missing element is the human body. Because the subjectivity, the personality of the wearer infuses the jewelry with her personal narrative. So I showed Tom Bin's one-off collection, which he keeps in shoe boxes. I love Tom Bin's in California. And he, it's not for sale, these pieces, and they were outrageous, but he agreed to work with me. And I thought it, I would sacrifice and rip up my Avedon book. I ripped the pictures out, um, and I pinned the jewelry to these various women. Because I wanted their, I think jewelry needs, comes with baggage. It comes with the baggage of the person who's wearing it. And you assume things about it depending on who's wearing it. So you can't show jewelry without a heavy given. That was what I, that was, that was my thought. Um, some things need these lamps, uh, again, an, as an alternative to a museum. Things sometimes don't speak for themselves. They need two voices. Sometimes you can't leave something. You can't leave a child on its own. There's got to be an adult. Philippe Stark designed these lamps, and he gave them to me to launch. And I said, Philippe, tell me what you're trying to do. He told me, and I said, it's going to be a big bomb, OK? Because what you told me to do, without you explaining that to me, I'm going to look at these and think, that's really cool. These are cool in a boy's room. You get to shoot. It's about vulgarity. It's about gold. It's about love. He said, that's not it at all. I said, well, write a manifesto. Because the foundation of this object is the manifesto. And without reading that manifesto, you ain't going to get the product. So I wrote it on the base. Okay? He wrote a manifesto, the first and last time he's ever done that about a product. It's completely indecipherable. I could understand a word of what he said. <laughs> I mean, is you, happiness is a hot gun glory to our dictators. OK, but he did it, all right? So I wrote it on the base. And what happened was we sold, I would say, 300, in excess of $300,000 worth of these lamps. And it was the biggest failure because no one got it. And I said to Philippe, this is the biggest failure of your career and mine to date because we didn't do it. They kept buying it because they like guns. Your whole spiel about the shadows return fast as didn't work. Okay? So it was just one of those curious things. But I think there's an obligation with a product to look at it and go, what, do I, what am I going to do with it? And this was where we started to be, I think, an alternative to the museum which was, you need a new plan of action. You have to look at something and go, what's it about? And how am I going to communicate that? Am I going to rip all the walls out? Am I going to take it and shout it from a mountaintop? What do you have? You've you got you to gotta regard something and figure out how you're going to communicate that. Um, OK, this I was curious. These are Angelo Mangiarotti tables, and I thought, I'm going to talk about the material. There's lots to talk about. But the material, again, addressing my, my subtext, okay, which I don't, I've never talked about, was I looked at the tables and I thought, there's so much marble in these. You can't even lift it. And if a psychiatrist said to me marble, I would say cutting board. <laughs> okay? So I thought, well, can I make a conference table into a cutting board? Can I make a coffee table? So I had this guy made these giant knives. And I thought it was amusing, because I think you can look at that. My objective was to not fool anybody, but see if I could get you. I felt that the thing about these tables was they were big slabs of marble. And so I wanted to show marble 
cutting board. So I, so I, and I think that was rather successful um, because I got the, the, you suddenly associate the material with a cutting surface. So, it, so that was my, that was my objective. Oops. Um, the, I wanted, I did clothes. We didn't sell one piece. This was, <laughs> this was Mark Jacobs. But I believe what, what I did this was, I don't know if you know Alice Rosthorn. She was the head, of, the director for a while of the um, London, the, what's it called? The Design Museum in London. Yeah, she's a great writer. The in, the Times. in the Times and yeah. the International Herald Tribune. Okay, and they kicked her out, okay, because, and it was D Dyson who did it, because the guys felt that like her hat, you know, hat collection that she showed and the floral arrangement, that's not design. Design is, is something else. And it really pissed me off. So, I mean, it really infuriated me because we can, we don't have to exclude. I want to increase it. I'm not talking about either or. I'm just talking about increasing the subject. So, so I thought, I'm going to show clothes. Mark Newsom designs airplanes, surfboards, macho bacho things. Here he did these clothes, okay? So I got this mannequin, and I did this collection of Mark Newsom. Now, it's true, I failed, because people don't want to buy clothes in a lamp store or in a thing, <laughs> you know? I mean, we have, we, we, there are places that we consider appropriate, but I'm fighting that. I'm trying to just suggest that the criteria, you, if it's Mark Newsom, it's like a novelist. You, 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 you attribute certain characteristics to this novelist, and then the guy writes a manual. And isn't it interesting to see if that's carried through? You know, that was my job. I could do that. I had no, I'm not a museum. I don't have a board. I thought that was appropriate. So, and uh, I got on his good list, so I went to some nice parties. Um, <laughs> dioramas. I built these dioramas. I built a long skinny one like this, I built a tall one, and I built a big fat whole room diorama. Dioramas were, came to me because of the, the Cornell boxes. And, and also I had this little foot thing that went around it because I went to the Museum of Natural History. And I decided that there would be these moments, three, where I would position things as, as sociological studies, products, in a, 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 to be evaluated in a natural habitat. And I thought, what's nice about a diorama is it could be a little world that doesn't sit in the rest of the world. It's its own little moment, confined within a box. Because you don't, most of you don't know me, but I'm very compulsive, and I would design the whole shop to be from a holistic point of view. Like, to me, if I change something in the front, I'd stay there all night to adjust, even if it was two things, so that the place was one story. Now, that was never evident. It was evident to me, but that's just me, okay? But the diorama didn't have to match. It could be another, it could be a, a floating charm bracelet thing. So this one was about utopia. I got the, this, this, I met this woman, and she did taxidermy, and I said, what's taxidermy about? And she said it's about, for her, sculpture, sculpting these animals with a certain behavior which are behaving un unnaturally. You know how there used to be paintings that they sold in France of monkeys playing cards? <laughs> Where, okay, well this is, this is seven or something uh, foxes which would, ne which would be at each other's throats. There'd be a bloodbath. And here they are frolicking. So I thought it was interesting to show a utopian scene where a bloodbath in the background has been turned into a William Morris wallpaper. <laughs> that I just thought was an interesting idea. Sometimes I did things, I decided I want to do something that's pretty. I know that's weird. But there's a, for 
But I, I would look at something and I would think, gee, that looks so pretty. Like there's a formalistic, there's an aesthetic. I never, it just looks great. Look at the chord. Like I thought, what am I going to do with the chord? And I thought, look at that chord. <laughs> that chord picks up on the whole thing, you know? So I just thought, sometimes it's, call it abstract expressionism, call it whatever. You could put things together for no other reason that they look well together. Those people that are married, don't they make a nice couple? How do you know? It's because they look good together. <laughs> so I thought, well, objects, you know, sometimes I think that looks great. I was, I look at that little light above it, how beautiful that looks. So anyway, sometimes I did just do that with no explanation. The umbrella chair. I met Kitano Pesce, enough said. <laughs> I love the man, okay? And there's a whole history, I deeply love him. But I met him before I opened the store, and then I did a show, a show, an exhibition in 1994, uh, nobody would remember this, on the umbrella chair, and I had about $12 to spend, okay? My whole first inventory was $6,000. And so I had this umbrella chair. This is not the, ex this is just a shot, because I took no pictures of anything at the time. And I wanted to demonstrate how absurd it would be to use normal conventional criteria for every design object. I'm looking for a chair, Murray, and here's what a chair is supposed to be. This is what I got all the time. It's supposed to be sturdy. It's never supposed to go out of style. It's got to go with my furniture. It's got to be washable. My kit has to be comfortable, whatever that means. And I'd go, why? Who says? Like maybe that's, if you want that, fine, but that's not everybody else's agenda. You don't own the, you can't dictate what, what is important to people in a chair. It's a chair. So maybe you should like look for what they're trying to give you and maybe you'll forfeit the washability because it's so gorgeous in yellow. Or maybe, you know, like, like loosen, take a vacation from yourself for a minute. <laughs> Okay, and, and don't bring your rigid criteria. Okay, heart valve, one question. Does it work? But this is a chair, and clearly this is not, this is weird. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I wanted to point out the absurdity to, 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 to get people to laugh at themselves and shake off some of that criteria. So I wanted to stress that it's necessary to be open to new criteria. I wanted people to know they should check their psychological baggage at my front door. So I did little five stations, like at the cross, five tests. I had test stations. <laughs> and one, th these were the stations, the conventional ways of evaluating how a, what a good chair is from a bad chair. So I had the aesthetic test, and I borrowed from Canal Plastics, a 12-foot statue of the David. Okay, all cracked and dirty and everything like that. And I had the David standing there, and then I had a sign that said, on a little easel, that said, aesthetic test. And then I put the chair next to it. And I wanted you to evaluate Catano's chair based on the David. <laughs> then I got live rabbits. And I had to get a rabbit keeper. It was a whole thing. I didn't know. Okay? I went way over my budget. But I felt I needed live rabbits. And I hung the chair, and I had it being pulled apart by rubber bands. And I had a sign that said, I am so confident this chair is sturdy that if I'm wrong, it'll kill these rabbits. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Nobody. It only lasted like four days. But, and then I had the water, I stuck it in a tube of water, it's water resistant. But I wanted you to go, that's insane to, to do this, because I wanted to change perception of how you evaluate very, very quickly. Um, Drogue Design, another exhibition. That this is alternative to music. I thought, uh, to, to museum, I thought, why don't I do a show where you can't buy anything? where it's not for sale, where it's really important. You look at it, you go, that's cool, I want that. And I, I Franklin, my partner, nearly had a heart attack, okay? And I said, so for three weeks, 
we want something. Because I felt, you know, everybody thinks everything is available to them. But do you know how much stuff there is that doesn't get made because an agreement hasn't been made between an artist, a designer, a producer, a technician, or whatever? The majority of things get lost and it's wasted. <laughs> and I wanted to have people, when something is presented, show a little respect, like that thing got made. So I showed these very appealing things and I put that in the window and I said, none of this is for sale. And people got really pissed off. They wanted, I had to sell, I called, this is the first one, and Rennie, who, who started this drove design, which was just meant to be an exhibition, she owned this piece and I called her, I said, they're gonna kill me, they're like mobs. This is the old, you gotta sell it. Name, whatever you, your price is, you could have all the money. But I, I, because my idea, ha ha, they're pissed off at me. <laughs> so she said, okay, sell it. So we sold this thing. But that was, that was my agenda. Um, I did a, a poster, uh, eating potatoes with a silver fork, drove design, Dutch industrial art post sunflowers. And what I wanted to do was create, oh, I also had nudity, because I felt um, if you're gonna have a show where people can't buy anything, you should at least have somebody flash a little. <laughs> okay, so I thought, they designed a shower, and I thought it's like a gun on the stage. You don't do a shower installation without having somebody take a shower. So I had this water refilled in a tank, and I found an actor, and I talked my voice off, explained to him this was very serious, he had his personal space, and that there was justification, and I wrote a script, and at the end, every 15 minutes, he'd take his towel off and take a shower. Big hit. <laughs> the biggest hit we've ever had. People still, people still, <laughs> okay, but, <laughs> you see, free beer and shower, wet party, okay? Um, and what I did post sunflowers was I felt this was Dutch work. And I thought it would be interesting to say post sunflowers, post Van Gogh. And um, uh, Rennie and Heiss, who found the drug design, argued with me from the beginning. This isn't Dutch, this isn't Dutch. And I said, okay, but it is. It's totally Dutch. <laughs> and I'm gonna, but I'll make, I'll say post sunflowers. Here's this guy who was the head of the Museum for Angevin de Kunst in the um, Museum for Applied Arts in Frankfurt, James Bradburn, who became a friend of mine, uh, was fired from that position. And he's called me immediately and he said, I'm fired, so now finally I could hire you to do an exhibition. Okay, because he said, I would be fired if I hired you before, but since I'm already fired, I don't have anything to lose. I got six months more, so why don't you do an exhibition? <laughs> so the agenda was to reconnect all the industrial products throughout the ages to their roots as commodities. All were traded at market. So what I did was, I think therefore I shop. Uh, okay. This is in backwards, but basically I did these exhibitions. I did two exhibitions. First of all, I, this is, the museum went on strike, by the way. I, no one would work with me. Uh, they gave me the keys to all the cases. I had a cart with white gloves. I did it entirely by myself. I painted the gallery. I called a truce. I wanted to explain to the meeting. I gave a wine party. No one came. They, to this day, they didn't like it, the museum. They, because I took a shoe from the medieval department and put it over there in the 20th century thing. I just put things, I moved things, and they didn't like it. It's not acceptable, okay? And what I wanted to do was, was, do you look at an object differently when you know you can buy it? So it was a little bit, I did, decided to do the exhibition in the store, the gift shop of the museum, and I, as the major part of it. And I had a series of uh, two identical display cases with multiple shelves 
These were the actual photos from the thing, but it's all twisted. And one of them, the one on the top, are, is the pieces in the museum collection. And the one on the bottom are the pieces you could buy in the shop, identical. And one case said museum, and the other case said store. Okay, and what I wanted to say was, which would more people looking at? Because the things were identical. Were you looking at the museum, no price, priceless object d'ar, or are you looking at the same thing in a store? Okay. Then I did the Wagenfeld teapots. And then this was my favorite one. Doesn't that look virtually identical? It's not. Okay, those are, those are two, those, one is you could buy and one you can't. And I wanted to, this is from 1760 on the top, and this is a current one. This, the price is 11,300 euro, and the other one has no price. And I wrote in this little catalog I did, is the museum shop the proper place to buy actual museum pieces? Because what I felt was, for example, not to be on the case, but with MoMA, I felt there's a little bit of embarrassment. Alfred Byer caused trouble. He said, a teapot is art, is modern art. It's not, a, it's not modern art and design. This museum is called art and design. There's no distinction at MoMA. It's the museum of modern art, and you're looking at a teapot. And they find that, I, in my opinion, a little distasteful because it's a teapot, so you sell it, and they've moved it across the street. So what I want to do was have the museum move into the gift shop and see what happens. In a museum, aren't you, in fact, window shopping? Most people go shopping, but they don't always buy. Shopping is no different than a museum experience. Then why do people prefer shopping to going to the museum? And I propose, what would happen if the Moss store morphed into the Mac? So I just changed their logo, um, and that was that experiment. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Was it a success in terms of public? Yeah, it was. Did they look at the, the store or the museum? They looked at the store. Um, well, what happened was I wanted to raise this issue of, of it's art. You don't, art is, it doesn't belong with commerce. That if it has a function and it's in a gift shop, you know, it's not art. And I thought that was prejudiced against the object because Alfred Barr saw it differently, somebody I respect. So I thought, why are they, they everybody goes with that, you know? And I wanted to put the two together and have you say, deal with it. This is a priceless museum object priceless because you can't buy it, and because we hold it in the same building under the same ages as our Van Gogh. And here's the same object, the duality that I was talking about, which you could buy because it's, it's got a price of 38 euro, and you could put it in your bag and calculate with it. It's a calculator. And I thought, why can't we allow that expansive definition of art and function? Why does it have to be either or? So I thought, instead of the, 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 the products trying to crash into the museum, why don't we have the museum try to crash into the gift shop? Anyway, uh, it didn't make me very popular. Um, but uh, Andy Warhol said something. Then I went on, oh, this, this was interesting. Um, sorry, it's messed up. On the bottom is a repaired plate from 1300 with a gold filling, you know, to show. And there's the Ted Muling plate for sale. So this is how many hundreds of years apart are we talking about? And I thought that it was interesting to show that museums educate us to how to look at its shopping. Like it helps you understand what you're looking at. That Ted Muling sort of is relying on the fact that it's not beside the point, that in order to uh, participate in the object culture in your personal lives, you got, you got to go to places like this. That was what my, what my objective was. Um, this is sort of, okay. Then 
Um, should I keep going with a little bit more of this? Okay. Um, I, I had this thing about busts. I wanted to do an exhibition, this is an alternative to museums, about factory output, about a factory, not about an object, because nobody did an exhibition about a factory. Sev was an ancient manufactory founded by Madame Pompadour, and I went to Sev and I said, after years, it wasn't the easy thing, after years I said, will you show me your storage room? Like, going back to the 18th century, what do you have in inventory? I was curious. It's owned by the state, and they, waste, they lose a lot of money, okay? And they're making these elaborate dinner services, and I was told by the directress, well, they go in the front door and out the back door of the Elysee, whatever that means, <laughs> okay? So I said, how many Napoleons from 1928 are there? One, six, what, are there, what, are the, what do you have in storage? So they let me go to the magazine. And there were like 47 pieces from the history of Sev. Most of them were busts. Most of them, the big ones, were the least important people. The mayor of Cam, okay, in 1886. <laughs> inflated with a thing, with a big thing on. And then they had a million Marie Antoinettes. I was in luck. 100% sell through, okay? And a lot of Napoleons and a lot of Dauphin, and there was, but they had these pieces, like say 40 busts, so I took the whole lot. I, I took the whole lot, and I did an exhibition called Les Visiteurs d'Ete, the Visitors of Summer, because I was a summer show. And I did these, pers you see some of them, they're, they're sort of, and I, and I combined it with Baccarat Crystal. And I wanted to bring back to reintroduce the anachronistic gesture of the human visage as a symbol of ideas, authority and power, state unification, political affiliations, national identity, allegiance, etc. I like busts, and, I, and we don't do it anymore. So, so I thought I would do it, and we sold all of them, actually, which was, look at how lovely. Um, of course, it didn't hurt that the film Marie Antoinette had just been made. <laughs> and who was it that made that film? What's her name? Jessica yeah, she bought like six Marie Antoinettes. So <laughs> it sort of saved me as they go. Then, okay, I had another idea. I wanted to show, my agenda was to show, again, alternatives to museum. Can you show vintage pieces with current production? Why is that segregated? Why is that important? So something amazing happened. There happened to be a guy who was the head of Nymphenburg, the Asian porcelain manufactory, which is owned by the Duke's Trust, Duke Franz of Bavaria, who would be the king of Bavaria, whom still you must address as your royal highness. Not easy, okay? And I noticed that they have all these statues by Joseph Wackerly on the grounds of the palace. So I thought, I'm just going to ask the Duke if he wouldn't mind if I take those statues to New York and sell them. <laughs> okay? And he said, yes. <laughs> At first, well, the thing that did it was I had a meeting with him. They said, you've got to call him your royal highness. Okay. And so I go to the palace, because it's on the grounds of the thing, and you sit in a chair. They brought in four chairs in the middle of the room, no table, no pound cake, nothing. <laughs> and I was very nervous, and it didn't go well. And then I said to him, Your Royal Highness, did you ever walk across the round and command that they make something for you especially? He went, yes, they did. Wait till I show you. He got all excited, and he came out with a statue of his dog. Okay, and for some reason, I don't know why I'm mentioning this, that endeared me to him for life. The pound cake arrived, because they're famous for the pound. If you get a piece of pound cake, you've been elevated <laughs> to a certain statue. And then he said, you mean those statues, those famous statues on our palace grounds? You could take those. So I was shocked, okay? I took them to New York. Look at these statues. They're fabulous. We didn't sell any. 
No, I sent them back. And then they, because they said they were going to come get me and put me in prison if I ever went to Germany again. <laughs> they were really pissed off when they found out, the museum people. But I thought, I thought it was important at an industrial design store to show vintage, to, 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 to show a spectrum, to, to, to break through that thing. Okay, a quick thing, but that was...